Hello. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes, it's good. We can, we can adjust the volume also. Oh, it's a different interface today. I think it changes every year, so I have to adapt my interface. This is the exact problem with programming, you know? If you keep changing the hardware underneath and if you keep changing the interface, the programmer goes crazy. They cannot change their program to take advantage of the underlying hardware because you change the interface to the hardware. It's a lot of work to actually change your program completely. So that's exactly the problem, problem I'm having right now. I knew the previous interface, I could program it nicely. And now they changed the interface, maybe or maybe not, they, uh, they, they changed the hardware, I don't know about that. Maybe it became better underneath. But because they changed the interface, which is the architecture level, now I'm lost as a programmer, right? Sorry, so I cannot change the, uh, oh yeah, I found the volume, so it took a while. <laughs> so maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> but you, need, you see there's, there's a psychological reaction to it also. It's not just, uh, it's not just a technical reaction. Your, your interface is completely different. Before you were programming single-threaded in C, and your architecture was x86, and now your, now your architecture becomes multi-threaded GPU, graphics processing unit, how do you switch your program from here to here? Not so easy. That's, the, that's architecture. Architecture has changed in this case, the interface has changed. Alternatively, somebody could have given, a, given you a GPU underneath without changing the interface and said your program that you programmed in the past for a CPU will run 1,000 times faster right now. You don't need to do anything. You'd prefer the second one, right? Who prefers the first one where you need to rewrite your program completely? Anybody? Nobody, good, nobody wants to torture themselves. Okay, maybe you want. <laughs> Who prefers the second one where you don't need to do anything and hardware becomes a thousand times faster? Well, I prefer that. Well, good luck getting that today. You're not gonna get that, unfortunately, going into the future as much. It used to be that way for decades and decades Hardware improved very, very significantly underneath. Uh, performance improved, power improved, and programmers didn't need to do much, basically. They didn't need to change their programs. They just, they could keep adding features and features to the programs and make them uh, better in that sense. And performance improved without the programmer thinking about it. And energy improved without the programmer thinking about it. But today, unfortunately, it's not that easy. We've hit a lot of limits in technology scaling in hardware. It's not so easy to actually uh, develop new hardware ideas to improve performance and power significantly without changing that interface, without burdening the programmer. And I tell the story, I, I wasn't thinking about telling the story, but this interface made, reminded me of exactly uh, where we are today uh, in computer architecture. And I would suggest you take this course as an example of this, basically. This, you, you will learn a lot in this course, and uh, having this mindset about uh, like architecture and uh, what you do underneath affects what happens at the programming level, at the higher levels, will be very important. So think about that as we go through this course. We'll see a lot of examples uh, where things that you change in the hardware affect the programmer uh, significantly. And we'll see a lot of trade-offs in terms of uh, what we should do in the hardware such that we can improve performance and power significantly such that uh, while, keeping, while keeping the burden on the programmers low. Uh, uh, before I take away more of Hassan's time, who's going to introduce the labs, uh, I'll give you one more example. Uh, well, GPU, uh, so GPUs are one example. GPUs, you can actually have GPU hardware, uh, but you cannot expect an existing program to run fast on the GPU hardware. What does the programmer need to do? The programmer needs to reprogram uh, their software, change the algorithm actually, to take advantage of the massively parallel hardware that has thousands of thousands of threads that is different from the CPUs today. Whereas we'll see the GPU hardware in lecture 15 or so, something like that. And you'll see the programming interface also. Another example, today machine learning is a big deal. Everything is a machine learning, right? You, there's a lot of data that we have. We'd like to really understand this data. We'd like to take advantage of it. Uh, for, for a long time, even, even though we knew the algorithms in terms of how to do machine learning, for example, stochastic gradient descent, which is really the basis of 
many machine learning deep neural network algorithms uh, has been around for a really long time. It's been known for almost 40 years, actually. But it, it didn't take off until recently, until 2012 or so, because the hardware was not fast enough. Now hardware is extremely fast. We have GPUs, for example, doing this. But even that's not fast enough. So people are designing specialized units, like the tensor processing units, machine learning accelerators. Uh, Google has it, NVIDIA has it, other companies, Microsoft have it, Microsoft uses FPGAs, for example. People are designing different forms of hardware to accelerate these machine learning and artificial intelligence tasks to make it much more energy efficient, much higher performance. And again, over there, you cannot expect just the underlying hardware to change and somehow magically these machine learning algorithms to execute faster. Sorry, I would love that also, but it's not happening. You really need to adapt your algorithm to the underlying hardware to use the interfaces or to design the interfaces such that these machine learning algorithms can execute much, much faster. We will see some examples of this also later, to, uh, later in this course around lecture, I believe, 18 or so, when we talk about systolic arrays. And we may cover some uh, machine learning accelerators that we have today. That's really uh, going to be used very pervasively in all of the uh, systems that you will have very soon. It will be, actually it is, it's going to be in these also, <laughs> even if, if they're not. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that I give you uh, some examples of the interface uh, and the course. Uh, today we're gonna cover the labs. Uh, it's important that we have this lecture early on because labs will start uh, very soon. Uh, it's important that you know what, what will happen in the labs. So Hassan will give you an overview of the logistics of the labs, uh, the different labs, what will happen, and also the uh, grading, etc. Grading is important, but I would suggest you, t uh, you, you come to this course with an open mindset of learning. Because grades are, of course, yeah, at some point you'll get grades. <laughs> But learning is the most important part. Learning is what stays. Think about this perspective. 30 years later, who will care about your grade? But 30 years later, people will care about what you've done in terms of what you've learned, and your learning really affects what you've done. So if you, if you have this perspective, you'll, take, you'll make the best out of this course. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, we will start with combination logic. So I, will, uh, I, will, I hope that you will attend the lecture because we will start with the very basics transistor uh, uh, as, as a building block for everything else that we build. We'll, build. we'll start with the transistor, and then we'll go into bits, and then gates, and then in the future lectures, we'll figure out how to actually design processors and processing units, computation units, and memories out of that. But tomorrow will be the basis of everything we'll start with. Okay, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Hassan so that he can cover the labs. Can you hear me? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> How about now? Okay. Um, yeah, so today we will do some, um, uh, so uh, uh, we will go over the labs. So basically we will um, get to know like in summary what we will do uh, in the upcoming like 10 weeks starting from uh, next week. I think the first session will be on Tuesday. Um, on Tuesday next week. Um, I hope you already signed up in the form that we um, released uh, through Moodle, and I think it's also in our website. So basically you need to sign up for uh, one of the sessions that we have. Um, and also, uh, like, let us know who is your partner, who you will be working with. Uh, if you haven't done so, I think you have to do it as quickly as possible. Um, so besides the summary of the labs, you'll also uh, get to know a little bit, like, what those FPGAs look like that we will be using uh, to implement our designs. So mostly we'll be um, implementing like relatively simple uh, circuits, but um, we will also look into like more complicated designs that we will like give you um, at like some working state and then you will um, keep adding some uh, changes to, uh, to, um, to basically make it more functional. Um, okay, so let's start with some uh, logistics first. Uh, so those are the rooms that um, we have uh, computers that the software we, uh, which we will be using is already installed. 
So those are the rooms where we will have our labs. And those are the lab stations and times. So you should already know all of these, I guess. Um, okay, so about grading. So we'll have 10 weeks of labs in total, and you will get 30 points. Uh, so it's like about three points per each lab. Um, so before every session, we will have the lab manuals online on our website. So you can like take a look uh, before uh, coming to the lab. And like you can even start in advance. So most of, uh, for most of the stuff you like, if you, unless you have questions, you can like uh, do them on your own. Um, so this is how, uh, how the grading policy looks like. So you'll be evaluated in class. So this is 70%. And you'll also submit lab reports, which is like 30% of your overall lab grade. Uh, so in-class evaluation is basically uh, based on uh, your like implementation. So if you like do everything as said in the manual, you get like full grade for your in-class evaluation. And then uh, and you have, I think, one week to complete this. So like, for example, if you're stationed on Tuesday, and you have started with lab one, you have exactly one week to complete lab one. Um, yeah, so when you start with lab two, basically you can get graded for lab one. Um, okay, so you can also like come to other sessions to, to get graded. Uh, but for lab reports, we will uh, have, I, I think, um, uh, submission links in Moodle, so you'll just uh, submit them to Moodle. Any questions so far? Let's do grading. Okay. Um, so I think this is important for most of you. Um, I hope not for most of you, assuming that you are um, all taking the class for the first time, but uh, if you have taken the class in the past and you want to use your lab grades, you can do that. Uh, but there's a um, one thing that you have to be careful about, which is uh, your grade from past years will be scaled to 70% because this year we have introduced those uh, lab reports that are required. Okay, so if you have 30 points from last year, it will be multiplied by 0 0.7, and this will be your grade. So if you use your grades from past year, you still have to submit lab reports to get the full grade. That's also clear. Okay, and you can find your past grades if you don't know them from uh, last year's Moodle. Here's the link, so you can just go there and then check. If your grade is not there, just send us an email. Um, and you can send email to um, here to this list, basically. Um, for other questions that you have, like more like technical questions, please use Moodle. I think that's the most efficient way for us to like respond to that type of questions. And also it avoids us to like responding to the same question over and over again when you do send an email only to us and other students cannot see it. Okay, I think that's it about grading. Still no questions? Okay. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, summarizing the labs. And then um, in the second part, we will look into um, what is this FPGA that we are talking about that we will be using in the labs and like what it means to program it. Um, so this is the um, transformation hierarchy that uh, we showed in the class, which like at the top we have the problem and then we uh, go all the way down to a physical layer where the um, actual implementation of the problem happens and hopefully we get some solution. So in this class, we mostly focus on uh, those three uh, layers, right? On the uh, software hardware interface, microarchitecture, and logic. Uh, so in the labs, we will um, mostly look at like how we can implement those things on those levels, right? So we will look a little bit into uh, like how you implement um, some simple circuits based on, um, let's say, Boolean algebra that you probably would know. Right, so basically it's a um, combination of gates, combination of and or gates connected together to, uh, to implement a more uh, complex circuit. Um, we will also like work at higher level, so mainly we will work at higher level where we describe um, what the hardware should do 
and some automated tools uh, do the transformation to a lower level such that we can, um, um, we can download the, um, the implementation to the FPGA and see it running. So we won't be always working at the lowest level possible, basically. Um, okay, so basically, um, so in the class you will see that uh, there are a lot of uh, trade-offs between like performance and uh, area and complexity mainly. So in many cases, we just want to uh, improve performance and then um, it comes at the cost of like some harder overhead, right? So um, you, you will see that there are like many optimization techniques for, uh, for processors, for, uh, for memories, and like most of them exploit some sort of trade-off. Uh, so we will um, have a lot of um, uh, like uh, practical examples where you will see like how this trade-off works, right? So for example, um, so you can, um, so let's say you have some circuit design and you want it to run faster but you have very long delay from like one end of the circuit to the other end. So you cannot clock it faster. So uh, like, let's say currently you can run it at one gigahertz, but you wanna like double this frequency, right? But due to physical constraints, you cannot do that. So one way to enable that is to add more stages, which we call like pipeline stages, right? And then each stage can run faster uh, because the critical path will be like shorter. Um, yeah, so basically you will learn how you can optimize your design trading off like some area or energy consumption or like some other metric to improve your um, performance or whatever you are targeting to improve. Uh, so we'll be mainly prototyping on FPGA and um, yeah, you will be able to like implement like all of your designs on an FPGA and see them running here. Um, so we'll also learn how to debug those um, circuits that we have implemented. So as in software, uh, so when you just like design your circuit, it is very likely that it will not work on the first time. So we'll also teach you techniques that you can use to debug your hardware and then um, make it work as you, um, as you want it to. So we'll be using hardware description languages, which are kind of similar to programming languages. We have like, when we write software programs. So those like makes things much easier um, by abstracting some like low level details. So we are like working at a um, much higher level, which like just basic, uh, basically makes the prototyping much faster. And for that we use a um, set of tools that are called computer aided design tools, right? Which basically do that transformation for us. Um, yeah. So let's start with the overview of the lab exercises. So I'll go over each lab one by one and then give you a like brief summary of like what will be the exercise on each lab. But before starting with that, I first want to show you the board that we will be using. Um, yeah, so this is a, um, an FPGA development board that has like many um, peripherals on it. So I will like uh, show some of those. Um, and so we will be using some of those in our exercises. So for example, here we have the USB port, right? So you know like that USB is like pretty uh, like flexible, so you can use it for different stuff. So we have like one USB port here that um, you can interface using your FPGA and then like you can uh, basically use this port to interface any device that, um, that also has like uh, a USB port. Um, for video output, we have a VGA here. So uh, at the end of the lecture, we will have a, a demo where I will show you a simple um, design that actually makes use of this VGA port and like um, display some um, graphics basically. Um, and then we have this um, micro USB port, which is used for um, driving power to the FPGA board and also um, we will use it to program the FPGA itself. So we will like transfer the data uh, to the FPGA and program it. Um, so we have the power switch. So we have seven segment displays. So those are important um, because, so both the seven segment displays and here we have like set of uh, LEDs in the bottom. So this is like 
the easiest way to get some visual output from your device. So those are pretty useful because in your device, so you can like easily implement some uh, signals that you'll be using for debugging, right? So um, let's say you have some state machine implemented and you want to know um, whether you get into some like specific state, right? And then you can basically route a signal such that when you're at that state, you will like turn on like one of those LEDs here. So those are pretty useful, especially for debugging because like you can easily access them. You can easily turn them on and off. And of course we have some switches. So those are for input. I think um, those do not require too much explanation. So basically you can like uh, drive like a one bit of input to your circuit using those switches. Uh, I think there are many of them here. So um, yeah, you can like drive like multiple bits at the same time. Similarly, we, you also have like uh, push, uh, push buttons we can, uh, which we can use to like provide more um, uh, input to, to our program that runs on the FPGA. And this is the FPGA chip. So this entire board is um, there just to like interface the FPGA with all those like uh, peripherals that we have here. But the FPGA chip itself that we will be programming is uh, pretty tiny. Um, there are some other stuff too on the board, for example, the clock. Um, yeah, so as, as you may know, synchronous circuits require a clock to like um, to run synchronously, basically. Um, and yeah, it is like implemented as a separate um, component on the chip. Um, yeah, and it is also programmable. So you can like change um, the, the frequency of that clock. So you, um, so you can run your design at different frequencies and then like analyze it, like how its um, performance changes, for example. Okay, so that's about the board. And later we will see that it again uh, when we get into the demo. Okay, so this is a summary of everything. So at the end of all the labs, you'll be able to uh, design a, um, a proper microprocessor. Um, maybe not a very uh, complicated one, uh, but definitely um, you, uh, you, you will have the uh, understanding of like how you can build it if you want to, right? And um, in fact, like we will incrementally over like multiple weeks, we'll have a small processor which will be able to execute a um, pretty large amount of instructions actually that you can uh, use to uh, write some useful programs. Okay, yeah, on, on each week we'll have a new exercise basically, uh, except I think for the last week, uh, which we have like a relatively longer exercise, which spans two weeks. Um, so yeah, we'll have like, we'll cover different examples in our lab sessions, but we also encourage you to experiment on your own. So you'll have, um, a board, uh, so we'll give you like a board, like I think a one board to you and to your partner. And um, yeah, you can just like take it home, of course, and um, experiment with it. Uh, so yeah, we really encourage you not to be like only bound to the, uh, to the lab exercises that we'll give you, but also like learn on your own and then try out different things. Yeah, and don't be scared to like play with it, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to damage it unless you do some like physical harm. Okay, so let's start with the um, labs and go over them one by one. So in the first lab, we won't be touching the FPGA yet because um, we will be covering uh, more basic stuff and um, it will be like more important to learn those basics rather than like starting to know like how we can actually program this. Uh, device and how we can implement our programs. So we'll be um, designing a um, comparison unit, basically that, we, uh, that, that can tell uh, the, uh, the relationship between two, uh, two different inputs, uh, such as like whether they're equal or which one's greater. Um, so this comparison unit will have two inputs and basically it will tell whether those are the same or not. So you'll be designing it using um, the, uh, the logic gates that you'll uh, learn about in the next lecture. Yeah, but 
yeah, although we will be not using the FPGA here in this lab, you can tr uh, try it later after we cover the, um, the basics about how to use the software uh, for, pro for programming the FPGA. So in the second week, um, we will be looking at another common operation that we use a lot in our programs, right, which is uh, basically addition. Uh, so we do, do addition a lot, a lot, especially like when iterating, um, when we like create some loops, right? So you always increment a number or like in general, there are like many use cases for an addition. Uh, so we'll be designing a basic, basic adder circuit that um, sums up two one-bit numbers. And then we will use this one-bit adder to create a bigger uh, four-bit adder, right? So we'll be um, using the principle of modular design here. Um, so the first adder, the one-bit adder, will be composed of uh, smaller gates, the smaller logic gates like AND and OR gates, but then we will be reusing this um, design, we will create multiple instances of it to, um, to design a bigger adder that will be doing hopefully something more useful by being able to work with larger numbers. Okay, and then we will be using uh, our FPGA for this. Basically for the inputs, we will be using the switches and we will show the output uh, by turning on and off the LEDs. Okay, things are starting to, I hope, um, being more excited in lab three. Uh, so we'll be using the seven segment display here. Um, so I hope you're still familiar with those kind of um, seven segment displays. You're not too young for it, but um, yeah, basically you have, uh, as, as the name uh, tells you, you have like seven different stripes here that you can use to like represent different uh, numbers and letters. So we'll be, uh, using our adder that we implemented in previous lab to show the output of the adder on this seven segment display. So, yeah, so basically we'll learn how to drive this uh, seven segment display on this lab. And then we will uh, learn about fine state machines. Um, so this is basically where we will first implement some sort of memory, right? So they, um, so we'll be, um, So we'll basically, um, we'll need to implement some sort of memory to be able to, um, to uh, tr transfer the information from one cycle to another cycle, um, information of like in which state we are. So a simple example of this is like um, cars like turn signals. So you know that um, like when you like wanna turn in um, your like signals like are flashing, so they remain on for a certain number of um, seconds and then they turn off, right? So implementing this with, a, um, with an FPGA will require, if your clock is faster, uh, will require you to stay in the same state. Let's say the turn signal is on state in multiple cycles, right? And then you'll move to the next state and you'll need to spend some time there. So I'm not sure if you can like, see this, but there's some like memory involved in there, right? So you have to, um, to keep in memory currently on which state you are, and then you also need to keep track of like for how long you have to be in that state. So yeah, we'll basically learn how to implement the concept of memory in our FPGAs in this lab. And then we will be implementing some simple final state machines. Um, in lab five, um, have you heard of the term a ALU? So it stands for uh, arithmetic logic unit. So this is uh, like one of the building blocks of uh, processors today, right? So it basically lets you do some like various um, arithmetic operations. So not only addition, but also some more complex things like uh, multiplication and division. Um, yeah, so in this lab, you'll implement this um, ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. Um, and those will be the operations that we will implement, right? So the addition, subtraction, multiplication, comparison, and some logic operations such as AND and OR. Um, then in lab six, we will um, be testing this ALU. So we will learn how to like debug it, how to look at um, um, different states it gets to at certain cycles or at like certain point of time. And also, I think we will provide you a 
um, a ready design which has like some bug in it, so you all need to discover what is this bug and fix it. So in lab seven, we will go a bit higher in the, um, in the uh, transformation hierarchy, and we will start writing an assembly code. So assembly code is um, basically the code that the compiler outputs, right, when it compiles your, um, your software written in higher level um, language. So we'll be using MIPS, so there's a no, um, yeah, so you, you, you probably know some like other um, assembly languages or instruction set architecture, such as like x86 um, Intel's architecture. So MIPS is like one example. So this is um, like in the class of um, RISC architectures called like the, the, uh, the name is like, uh, the, the name RISC stands for reduced instruction set architecture, means that um, the instructions are designed in a such a way that they do um, like simple operations rather than complex iteration, uh, complex operations as in x86. Um, yeah, so we'll be using MIPS and we'll ask you to write some simple, uh, some simple programs and one of them will be um, for manipulating images. Um, so images, unless they're compressed, are stored as a bitmap, right? So for each bit in your image, you are storing some um, set of numbers, typically between zero and 255. Um, so we will be implementing some filters, basically, to, to manipulate those images and hopefully make them nicer. Then in lab eight, we will move to full system integration. So this is the, uh, the, the, the lab that um, will be covered in two weeks, and we will learn in more detail how we can build a, a full processor and how we can interface it, right? So we will be building the processor and also we'll implement some programs that run on this processor on the FPGA. And one of the programs will be a snake, the snake game. Um, so I also hope you are not too young for this. Look, that's, does that mean anything to you when like, the snake game, everybody knows that? Okay, it's still a thing. Um, okay, so and in lab nine, so this will be the last lab, I think. We will be um, looking into performance issues. So we will basically try to improve the performance of, uh, of the processor that we will design in lab eight. And here we will do that by basically adding some more complex operations like multiplication bit shifting to, to, uh, to make the program that we designed in the previous labs faster. So this will basically help applications that make heavy use of those multiplication and bit shifting operations. Okay, so any questions so far regarding the labs? Yes? Yeah, it's, it's quite different from CPU programming. So there's like no a, like defined instruction set architecture that you use as you like program um, the CPUs. So we'll cover this in the second part of the lecture. So I will show you like how um, the FPGA architecture looks like and what I mean by programming it. But basically it is, um, it, it is really about like encoding your like target hardware design in the FPGA, not with like instruction set architecture, but with some programmable uh, units that are there in the FPGA. Uh, which is, so it, it will be more clear in the second part. So let me not know if you like still have questions after that. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay, so then let's start with it since we still have some time. Um, okay, so what's an FPGA? So it stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. So uh, the, the name is kind of weird, but it simply means you can program it on runtime. So it's not like programmable on fabrication time, but you can like program it over and over again. Um, and yeah, 
it's, it's, it's basically, you can think of it as like something that is runtime uh, programmable. Um, so it's, it's basically a reconfigurable substrate that is like integrated in this, um, um, in, in, in this FPGA chip. So there are like multiple things that you can program, so I will try to cover some of them. But like modern FPGAs are much more complicated than this, and they even have some like specialized units to do some specific tasks much faster and in a much more efficient way. So mainly there will be uh, a way to, uh, to reconfigure the functionality that the FPGA is implementing. So we will have an example for that. It's also possible to, uh, to reconfigure the interconnection between those functions, let's say. Um, so basically, you'll be able to uh, reconfigure like the path, like which functional unit will have its output connected to another functional unit. Um, and there are also like other stuff that's configurable, like uh, input and output paths. So um, we will not cover those, but um, yeah, I just wanted to have the list here. So yeah, so the FPGA is mainly used for rapid prototyping as it fills the gap between software and hardware. So it is like, um, let's say you have a, some like hardware design and you wanna like just see if it's like working as, as you intend, right? So the FPGA is a great way of like testing the circuits uh, as um, compared to like software, you can like interface any other hardware component directly by uh, at, at, at circuit level without any software intervention. But it's not as, um, it's not like a proper hardware because it's not built specifically for that task. So it's slightly less efficient than like um, a pure custom hardware design. Okay, so in general, it achieves higher performance than software if you know what you're doing. But um, yeah, it could be slower as well, like if you have a bad design. And it has more flex flexible than hardware. I think this is clear because like, it's, it's not like bound to any like, specific instruction set architecture on, or anything. So uh, given the constraints or given the size of the FPGA, you can like, implement pretty much any, uh, any digital circuit. Okay, and here um, we have like the two main building blocks of an like typical FPGA. So those main uh, those building blocks are the lookup tables and the switches. So lookup table is basically um, the functional unit I referred to in the previous slide. So you basically um, change the values in this lookup table um, such that some specific inputs that you will provide will give you the output that you want it to. Um, that you want to, uh, to get out of this lookup table. So it will be more clear in the uh, next slide where we'll, I will show you an example. But basically the FPGA is composed of like multiple of those lookup tables and some um, programmable switches between those. So basically, uh, let's say you have programmed this, um, you have programmed this lookup table over here to do like logic and operation, right? So you have two input signals, and then if both of them are one, you will output one. So you have that, and then you want to, um, okay, and then you want to basically connect this output to be an input to this lookup table here. And yeah, after configuring those lookup tables, basically what you have to do is you have to, you also have to configure those switches so you route those signals properly. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's clear from here, but um, so there's a like one difficult thing about like, those like making those FPGAs work, and this is like where we will get a lot of help from the software that we are using, and it is there are too many possibilities, right? So you can have your design, so you, you can know like how it will look like, like how many lookup tables you will use, and how they should be connected, but placing them on the FPGA and then routing them. It's a problem that is very difficult to solve. So basically, let's say you have a design that's composed of only two lookup tables, right? So how are you gonna know like what is the most efficient um, selection of those lookup tables, right? So does it make more sense to pick this lookup table and this lookup table, or pick this lookup table and this lookup table, and then how to route them? So basically there are too many uh, possibilities to like map and route, which, um, 
it's not an easy task to do manually. So this is why uh, we'll, um, so this is like one of the like biggest reasons why we'll be using those um, CAD tools uh, that I mentioned in the previous slides. Okay, so this is how the lookup table looks like. And let me show you how we can implement a simple function, which is, um, wait, um, so, so, so the function we'll be implementing will be, um, so we'll provide two bits of input, and if uh, two or more bits of this input are one, we will want this lookup table to produce one, and in other cases, produce zero. Okay, so if we have more than, one, uh, more than two ones in our three bit input, we'll um, output one, one as a result. And okay, so since this is a three bit lookup table, we have um, eight different uh, locations in here to which we can like write something. Okay, so those like yellow boxes here are, um, so they represent a single bit that can be configured, right? And then here we have this unit called a multiplexer, which helps you select one of those um, bits, uh, yeah, the, the, the yellow boxes over here and, um, and move, the, uh, move its data to the output. Um, okay, and this is how this multiplexer works, um, basically. So if the input is three zeros, it basically selects this bit over here and then routes it to the output. It's pretty simple, right? And then like two to the third is like eight. We have like eight different um, locations here that we can use to forward the output. So the point of having this lookup table is that, um, so you can implement any sort of uh, digital circuit that has three inputs and one bit of output, right? So using this, it's possible to implement like everything. So, and um, yeah, it, it can implement any three bit input function. So, so let's look at this example. So we'll implement a function that outputs one when there are more than ones, uh, more than one ones in the selected input. I said two previously. Okay, it's more than one one. So basically, what we want to happen is, all in those cases, like initially, where we have only one bit set as a one, we want to output zero, right? And it's pretty simple, uh, I assume, like how to do that, right? So simply, you put zeros here when you see only, um, only one bit set as one in the input, and otherwise, you set one. And then whenever we drive uh, three bits here as an input, we'll choose the corresponding value such that this is doing exactly what we want to do. Okay, so this was a um, simple example, but uh, in practice things get more complicated as you start building more complex gates. So, um, so one reason why it becomes more difficult is that you don't have like any size lookup tables in the FPGA. So usually, so I think in today's FPGA, it's either five or six bit input uh, lookup tables that you have. And then you have to figure out how to use those in combination such that you can implement more uh, complex circuits such as let's say 32 bit adder, right? So you definitely cannot do it with a single uh, three bit adder. But if you use, uh, sorry, single three bit lookup table, but if you use like multiple of those and connect them, um, somehow you can achieve this, uh, this more complex design. Okay, um, so I think, I think we can have a break now and then we can continue with the rest. Okay, so let's continue with the, um, with the FPGA architectures. So is it clear like how we implement any tree bit input uh, logic using lookup tables. So it's pretty straightforward, like, so, right? So it's basically a brute force approach. So you encode like all the results that you know of your target function. And then when you access this lookup table, it gives you exactly that value that you have stored in it. 
Okay, but uh, building some more complex stuff is much more difficult, and I said that for that, um, for such purposes, we will be, um, we won't be able to do everything manually, and for that reason, we will be using some uh, software support. Yeah, so as this picture is trying to show you here, you are dealing with a huge number of um, lookup tables and um, switches here on the on the entire FPGA, and if you're design um, that you are targeting to map to this FPGA is complex, like things get uh, even worse. So yeah, you really need to uh, have some support here to translate your high level design into this uh, FPGA logic. So think of it as the job that the compiler is doing, right? So you, you are working on a much uh, simpler level of abstraction when you like use your favorite uh, programming language, but it gets translated to, uh, to a machine code that if you look at it, like, it just um, doesn't mean anything. Okay, so this was like how like some um, like very simple FPGA would look like, but um, in modern FPGAs, things are uh, slightly, slightly more different. So first of all, the lookup tables are usually bigger. So I think they use either five or six input lookup tables or both. And there are like many of them. Uh, there's also a lot of um, on-chip memory in those FPGAs. Because like memory is important, like on like many type of applications, you require, your application may require a lot of um, memory to like store some temporary data. And um, you usually want to access this data uh, very fast. For that reason, um, FPGA manufacturers Im uh, Im implement some memories on chip on the FPGA uh, such that you can use it for the, the, those applications. So those are not configurable as the lookup uh, tables, but you can use them as a memory basically to store some uh, temporary data. Um, yeah, there are also some hard code special purpose hardware blocks. So for example, there, uh, there's like uh, something called DSP core. So DSP stands for Digital signal, signal Processing, and those basically implement some um, uh, common functionality that is used a lot in digital signal processing. Um, there are like many uh, other special purpose hardware blocks which are mainly used to, uh, to interface um, uh, devices or that have to communicate very fast or require um, a lot of throughput. So one example is the memory, right? The main memory or the DRAM as, uh, as like we have in our like laptops or desktop machines. So if you really want to have a like fast running machine, you, you want to interface this as fast as possible. So implementing that DRAM interface on FPGA, like using the lookup tables might be possible, but it will be slow. Um, so, to be able to access this as fast as possible, uh, there's some sort of specialization happening uh, on the FPGA chips. Uh, so there are even uh, embedded pro uh, processors on the FPGAs. Um, so I think uh, I have a, so in this picture we can see it, right? So this is a uh, schematic of a, like um, some like modern uh, FPGA from uh, Xilinx. And as you see here, it has, Two, um, two physical ARM-based CPUs here. So those are, not, those are programmable, not reconfigurable, right? So those are not composed of FPGA logic, but those are like just um, custom hardware design that is put there on the same chip with the rest of the FPGA logic, which is the uh, relatively smaller area here. Um, yeah, and then we have like, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we also have like all of other um, special units such as the memory interface or, um, or DMA here, which is used to communicate with devices like hard, hard disks or solid state drives. And like some other interfaces that we use to, um, uh, to interface the display port or HDMI or similar, um, uh, or similar interfaces. But even when we look at the programmable logic part, it is not just lookup tables and switches, right? So it is um, um, like more diverse than that. So we have like a general purpose IO, which is configurable. We have some like other types of um, 
blocks in there that have some degree of configurability. And those are um, essential for implementing um, fast and efficient FPGA designs. So in general, the advantages of uh, the advantages and disadvantages of FPGAs are those. So it is usually like uh, FPGAs usually have lower uh, development cost. So if you want to um, if if you want to interface, for example, a um, what will be a simple example here. So let's say you want to uh, display something on a monitor, right? So like, do you know how to do that using a um, a CPU chip? Like not like connecting your laptop to uh, to the projector, but like doing it manually. Um, so that will require you to interface with the um, device, right? So you have to have a like physical channel. So you have to drive this um, like VGA or or HDMI interface by your own, and you have to have some like hardware design. Um, so you can do that in a much easier way using an FPGA because. It is like, um, so there's like only the design there, like the FPGA, which is designed in a way that you can configure it to, to interface this, um, um, to like interface the like monitor or like any other device connected to the VGA port by um, reprogramming the FPGA. So it usually has a shorter time to market because you don't have to go into the steps of like manufacturing an actual chip, but it's just enough to design um, your um, your circuit using a high level language and then translate it such that it maps to the um, target FPGA. And other advantages are uh, other advantages are that uh, uh, are is that um, other advantages are it is configurable configurable in the field, meaning that if you have your any bug in your design, you can easily patch it. Right, so you don't have to. Um, take out your like, current CPU and replace it with some other CPU that doesn't have the bug, but you can just like patch it or change it, like add more uh, functionality. Yeah, and it is reusable, like, which means that you can like use it for like different purposes. Like today you are using it for like application A, tomorrow you may want to implement like completely different application. Um, okay, so the disadvantages are that it is not as fast as like implementing a custom hardware, like I mean, like a integrated circuit that does only exactly what you want it to do. So if if your goal is like only supporting some specific application, and you are like okay with like spending a lot of money to build that, um, then it's it's probably more efficient to do that on ASIC, right? Or to to have a like a custom hardware design rather than implementing it on FPGA, because this um, way of um, sort of emulating the hardware using those lookup tables and programmable switches at some indirection and overhead, right? So it's not as, uh, it's not the same as like having just a single gate that performs the end operation, but instead you are accessing some table that encodes your values. Yeah, and all this like um, ability to like reconfigure this like FPGA at some area overhead as well. So it's not as dense as like logic you can get into like special, uh, like custom hardware. Okay, so to deal with um, complicated designs on FPGAs or I think um, so those like computer aided design tools are also used like in any sort of hardware design, actually not only for FPGAs, right? Um, so yeah, the, de dealing with complexity always requires some levels of abstractions. So you can like, um, but not need to learn every step in the um, in the path to like implementing a problem or s solving a problem uh, by using some specific um, hardware. So there are like too many resources on the FPGAs, and this makes the programming them very difficult. Um, so some problems are that like. Um, so we will be basically using those uh, CAT tools to convert our high-level functional descriptions into actual hardware. So we will not actually know exactly how those high-level things are encoded, but um, those tools will basically make sure that whatever you describe will happen on the underlying hardware somehow. 
So I think a very simple example is to like add two numbers, right? So using some like high level description languages, you can just represent this as a like plus sign as you do as as you do when you um, uh, as you do in software programming, right? But then those tools translated to like set of uh, lookup tables and then some mappings between them such that it does this addition, but you don't go and like manually um, do this um, design yourself. So yeah, so those tools will map our designs into like many of those lookup tables, right? So it will pick which um, lookup tables to use and it will try to uh, optimally configure the, the switches between them. And the tool, the, those cat tools usually output a final configuration file, which you can use to directly program the device. Um, so yeah, today we'll have a demo on that, that um, I will show you a program that I already um, implemented and downloaded to the FPGA. Okay, so this is the general design flow uh, when you do an FPGA prototyping. So we start from the prob problem definition and we um, write a, a program in hardware description language, uh, HDL for short. And this basically describes what our design should do, like functionally. And two like very common languages used are Verilog and BHDL. Um, so we'll be using Verilog in this lecture. Uh, and this will be your task in all of the exercises, basically, um, to, to represent the given problem, uh, a solution, to represent the solution for, for the given problem using this very low hardware description language. And those are the steps that the tool will be doing. So it's like logic synthesis, meaning like translating those like high level functional operations into hardware building blocks and then placing those on the FPGA, like picking which lookup tables to use, as I said, and routing them. And then finally, it will um, generate a file called bitstream that we will use to program the FPGA. Okay, so actually this programming the FPGA part is also something you have to do, but um, it's, it's much simpler than the main task you will be doing, which is like a problem to, um, to Verilog part. Okay, so we will be using a software called Xilinx Vivado. So we'll have this installed on the labs uh, that we'll be um, having our lab sessions, but you can also install this um, on your own laptop. Um, there will be instructions on how to install this. Okay, so basically, uh, if you have used like any IDE, like for software programming, it looks like that. It has like a simple text editor, and also it has some like other um, um, other um, functions on its interface to, uh, to navigate you through this design flow I showed you here. Um, yeah, so I will show you later how this like, software looks like. Um, so it also has a simulator integrated on it. So uh, when you have your design implemented using Verilog, instead of like directly trying it on an FPGA, you can first simulate it and see like um, cycle by cycle transition of every uh, uh, digital signal and see basically on simulation whether it works as, as intended. Um, yeah, those simulations are also used to debug your designs and find the, uh, uh, the problems and fix them. Um, yeah, so we'll be using basically an USB cable to, to program the FPGA and this Xilinx Vivado will be doing like all the magic to, um, uh, to convert our Verilog to, um, to the FPGA compatible bit file. So those are the rooms that um, the software is installed. So I believe you can use those rooms um, outside of the like lab session hours, unless there's a lecture and, then, uh, and they don't let you in. Uh, so I think those are always open rooms and accessible. Uh, but as I said, you can also install Vivad on your own laptop. Okay, so we will um, try to have a demo. Hopefully it will work. Um, so in the demo, I will show you like uh, what Vivado and Verilog code looks like. So 
probably it won't mean much to you, but um, I think it will be good for you to like see it here. And later you can also watch the, uh, uh, watch the video online once you like start uh, working with the tool um, in the second week of the lab. So we'll follow the FPGA design flow steps that covered in the uh, previous slide and then download the bitstream to the FPGA. So this will be the um, example program that we'll implement. So it's called a Pong game. So it's basically, uh, we'll have a like ball on the screen and then we'll have like, um, yeah, you, you will see the game, but uh, probably like we have seen like um, the, the different versions of that. So it's, it's a relatively simple design and the process of showing you this is that um, hopefully by the end of the lecture, like you will be able to understand or implement uh, such uh, like games that have like, um, um, that like get input from, uh, from the push buttons and display something on the VGA. Um, okay. Okay, so let's start with the demo. So this is the, um, this is the, um, Vivado window, so this is like how it looks like when you open your project. Um, so I have it. That's weird. How about now? Okay, yeah, sorry for that. Um, okay, now you can see it. Um, so I already have the project open and I added the source files here, but um, you can go and try them on your own. So uh, there's, uh, the, uh, there was a link on the slides, so you can basically download the project, like install Vivada on your machine and like do those steps that I will show here. Um, so first I wanna show you, um, how much time do I have? Okay, so this is, um, like how the hierarchy of the soft, uh, source files looks like. So Vivado automatically uh, like shows those in a um, like hierarchy such that um, like modules that are instantiated in the other, uh, other modules are um, like grouped like this here, right? So basically when you look at this, we can see that this module called main control um, instantiates this clock wizard module and some other modules over here. So the clock wizard module is important, so you may use it in uh, some of your designs. So it is basically here to, um, to change the, um, the frequency of your clock. So the, the clock that is on the board is programmable, so you can like go and program it like uh, through um, a serial interface, but it is also possible to uh, to change the frequency of a clock using a digital circuit. Um, yeah, so this block over here is basically doing that. So let's say the input is like 50 megahertz. You can use this to divide the clock by two uh, to make it uh, 25 megahertz if your design requires that. Okay, um, so this is the main file, like which is which we call the top module, right? So this is the, um, upper level module which directly interfaces with the outside world. So those input and output signals here that you see are connected to, um, to some of the um, units here on the FPGA board. Uh, so the, the, yeah, so basically those inputs and outputs are things that go outside the FPGA. Okay, and, um, and we use a, constraints file, um, it is called constraints file to, to tell Vivado exactly like which of those signals to be connected where on the board. Uh, so that's important to do, otherwise um, like you cannot guarantee that this clock signal, for example, will be connected to the, to the clock on the, uh, on, on, on the FPGA board, right? So it, 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 it may get connected to, um, to something random. Okay, anyway, so those are like all the input and output signals here on, those design, uh, on, on this design. It's not important exactly what they're doing at this moment, but um, uh, so basically here we can see that uh, there are some like um, buttons implemented, so you can like infer it from the name. 
Um, so those are basically the buttons we will be using to, to move um, the sliders that we will see. Uh, actually, I'm wondering whether it would have been better to show you the demo first and then go over the software. Um, okay, and uh, there is another button to, to start the game, basically. Okay, and so here, um, let me see. So here we see that those different modules that I sh showed you in the hierarchy over here are instantiated. Wait, yeah, over here. Um, okay. And here's some like other logic implemented to like make this game work. Okay, so let me show you the game. Um, so actually first, um, yeah, so those are the steps that we need to do to, uh, to translate this like very low code here, which is like, um, which is not making any sense to you at the moment to, to, um, to a form that we can download to the FPGA. So those are the steps that I showed in the slides in the design flow. So we first need to run the synthesis. So this is the step where our very low code is mapped to functional units. Uh, to like function units representation. And the implementation is where the um, actual like placement and routing of this design on the FPJ happens. Um, yeah, and then in the last step, we get our bitstream. So I did all the steps, so they took some time. So this is why I don't wanna like do it here uh, on the class. Um, yeah, so I've done all of those and already downloaded the um, the program to the FPGA. Actually, I didn't download it to the FPGA. I downloaded it to the Flash chip that is on the FPGA board. So the reason I did that was to preserve the program when I um, uh, when I shut down the board. So when you program the FPGA directly, which we'll be doing in the class because it's it's, it's faster, uh, you lose your program that you have downloaded to the FPGA if you uh, disconnect the power or shut down the FPGA. Um, so basically the, the configurability on the FPGA is volatile, right? And if you make, if you, if you want to like permanently put a program to your FPGA, you, um, you can use a flash chip, which is typically always available on this kind of development boards. So you basically put your program into this flash chip, which is non-volatile, and then every time you power on your board, this program gets to the FPGA automatically. Okay, so it is what will happen. Um, so let me first like show you the FPGA over here. This is DocuCam. Okay, so this is the FPGA you saw in the um, picture on the slides. So I'll just like plug it in on my machine and turn it on. So it is currently basically going through those steps of programming and you see the seven segment display which shows that the program was like transferred, loaded from the flash chip to the FPGA. Now um, it is working, basically the Pong game has started probably, but um, we have to switch to the VGA over here to see it. I hope you will be able to see it. Okay, it's classic. Um, let's start. Re uh, let's start rebooting. Interesting. Am I using the right thing? It's PC VGA. Okay, yeah, sorry for that. Um, last time it worked. Mm -mm. Okay, so it doesn't seem to work. So I will try one more time. And then if not, 
Okay, it's it's not working for some reason. Um, so let's switch back to DocuCam. So I assume there's a problem with the uh, VGA interface um, because we can see that here, like one of the zeros turns to one. So this is the score basically. So one of the players uh, got the score of one uh, when I like press the start button. Um, yeah, so it is doing what it's supposed to do, but uh, we cannot see it for, for some reason. Um, okay, so I will, so you can try it on your own or I will also upload a video like showing like what this looks like. Um, okay, so I think, I think that's pretty much it for today. And so about like how to use this software and um, like doing all the steps all the way through the programming, the FPGAs, we'll have like some uh, documentation available to you. So you can like uh, take a look at those. Uh, so um, yeah, and learn how to use it basically. Okay, are there any questions? Hopefully not related to the failed demo. Okay, then thank you and see you tomorrow.